and deals with the foot wash. Yeah. It's all seen in the scripture. The principle is taught. And God's not doing things differently than He did then. He's not having Paul teach something that's done differently than it was done when the Lord Himself did it. And I say that because if it was something was sin a hundred years ago, and there's a big if, if something was sin a hundred years ago, guess what? It's still sin. Yep. It is still sin if it was sin then. Come on. Yeah. If it was a gray area a hundred years ago, be aware and be careful. It's a slippery slope. If it was then, it is now. This is what he's trying to teach. He, this is not something that was new. This is something that God had taught back in the, in the book of Matthew. And now uh, Paul is teaching it to the church. It was received of the Lord. The Lord gave the practice. And the Lord gave the principle. And the Lord gave the purpose of the Lord's table on this thing. He says, after the same manner, or take, he said, and, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. After the same manner also took the cup when he had supped. This is what the Lord had done. It's the same thing. Now, we don't have to ask what would Jesus do. You know what Jesus would do? If you had 5,000 people out there and had a couple of fishes, a couple of a few loaves, he'd pray over it, he'd break it up, and he'd end up with 12 baskets full. And how do you know that's what Jesus would do? That's what Jesus did. That's it. But if you've got a couple of fishes and some loaves, and you've got a friend in need, and he's knocking at your door saying, I need something, guess what? You can always give him some of it. I'm not worried about what Jesus would do. I'm asking you what you could do Good. and what you should do. Come on. Come on. This memory or this, this ministry was received. This ministry of the Lord's table was a remembrance. And I, I'm going to deal with this more some other time. But he says, do this in this do in remembrance of me. It was to bring our mind back to Christ. The Christian life is getting your eyes looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's right. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto him and what he did, who he is, and what he did for us. Mm -hmm. That is the Christian life. The Christian life is not rules of touch not, taste not, handle not. We touch not, taste not, handle not because our eyes are not on those things. Our eyes are not on these things of, hey, listen, this new truck. My eyes are not on a new truck. My eyes are on the Lord. And my eyes are on the Lord, and the Lord says, Buy this truck, I buy this truck. If he says, don't buy it, I don't buy that truck. But I like that truck. It's pretty. It's yellow. <clears throat> and it would fit in our family. <laughs> Amen. Because I've got two yellow cars in the house. Well, they're not at the house right now. Maybe one of them is. I'm just trying to say, uh, we, we just, uh, it's just, I mean, I might like that truck. It might look nice. But if I'm looking under Jesus, I don't buy that because I like it, because it looks nice. I buy it when God says buy it. If God says buy it. Why? Because I'm looking under Jesus. Just because I like it doesn't mean it's good for me. That's right. Listen, I have no desire to be on metformin, have no desire to be on insulin, have no desire to be on any of those things, so you know what I don't eat? I don't eat hundreds of carbs and lots of sugar. Why? I know I'm so close that I can cross over at any moment. 
And I realize if I, I better stop living for self and start living for the Savior in that area. And I find every other area you're supposed to do the same thing. Does it glorify God? It's a remembrance of all He's done for us. And if you remember what He's done for us, who died and bore that, bear our sins in His own body on that cross, on that tree, He bared our sins and died for us. Should we not live for Him? So there is the responsibility of the Lord's table. And that is what is the main part here. And I will try to be very quick in dealing with this. I have mentioned the actions and the attitudes of the fleshly foolishness that we can find in the history of Israel in, in, in uh, Exodus 32 that we can find in, in the horribleness of ritualistic religion. They have no hope in their hearts if they're just doing it rituals. Rituals do not bring you hope. They do not bring you help. Somebody says, I go through and I say this certain phrase every day. And it becomes a ritual. It is like coming at the end of your prayers and saying, well, I did better say in Jesus' name. And let me say, we ought to pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not about the words there. It's about the attitude. It's about what would the Lord have me to pray for? When I go to pray, do I go in my ability, in my spirituality, or do I go in the will of God? Or if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. I believe we read, read that in Sunday school today. And if we know that He hears whatsoever we ask, we know that we have a petition we desire to heal. Yep. This is not ritualism. And when we take of the Lord's table, it is not ritualism. There's a responsibility. The religious crowd has no hope in their heart. It's like putting a band-aid on a burst artery. All of a sudden they feel good for a minute, but nothing had changes, nothing helps. I watched it just last week when a man walked in a hospital room and said, do you want to take the uh, communion? And the man says, yes, I'll take it. And I asked the man after the other man left, I said, then what did that do for you? You were telling me you were depressed. You were telling me you had no peace before he showed up. And you, do you have peace and not depression now? He said he's been doing this every day since you've been in a hospital. What's it done for you? Ritualism does nothing for you. Realist, realism does a lot. When you recognize that this represents the Lord's body, it represents the Lord's blood, and you call it remembrance, what Christ did for you and who He is that did all this for you, it changes something. There are two areas of this, two areas of this responsibility <coughs> that I'm going to deal with. And the first is the examination. You'll see in verses 28, 7 and 28. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. The examination. Why should we examine? Why should we examine? Because of the fact that Christ did it all for you. And you ought to examine are you living all out for Him? Are you doing this worthily? With the right attitude? Are you doing it flippantly? Well, this is just what we do. This is just how we operate. Well, we're just going to have the Lord's table and that's how we're going to be. Because we do it once every few months. Right. And so we do it. And we're just going to have it. Well, that's what we do. Because of the remembrance. 
of what he did for us. That's why. Because of the remembrance of who he is that shed his blood for us. We ought to examine ourselves. But not only if that's not good enough, there's a recompense. If you do not examine yourself, you will find yourself guilty. If you take this thing with the wrong attitude, you'll find yourself guilty. And you'll be drinking damnation to yourself. And that word there is not about eternal damnation, but a judgment of God upon you. There's many sickly and many that have died because they had a wrong attitude about the walk with God and partaking of the Lord's table. There is a recompense. Let me say this. He's talking to a church. Which means most of them are probably saved. Most of them think they're walking with God. Most of them think they're doing okay. And he said, you will drink damnation to yourself. You'll bring a sicknesses upon your own body if you take a partake of the Lord's table unworthily. If you had the wrong attitude about it. If you have a wrong attitude about sin in your life, if you regard iniquity, that means put a guard around. As a, if you put a guard around, you say, I don't want to do it. I just want to do it. I just want to live in sin. I like it. I like my sin and I'm going to keep on doing it. It doesn't matter what God says. Don't tell me people don't do that. I can show them in the book right here about wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I can show the word says if you put a drink in somebody's mouth, you'll end up showing them show up getting naked. And let me say, you lose your inhibitions when you start taking alcohol and drugs. And next thing you know, you're doing things you would have never done if you would have been sober. You're going to place you've never gone. You're watching things, seeing things, you're doing things you've never done. He deals with fornication in this book. And yet I know people that you can tell them that's sin and they say, well, I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. Let me say, what matters how I see it? What matters how you see it? How does God see it? No fornicators, no liars. No thieves, no murders will enter into eternal life. And such were some of you. But you, you're washed, you've repented, you've come to Christ. And you said, I'm putting away all my sin the best I know. And when I find sin in my life, I want it out of my life. Whatever it is, whether it's what you want, whether it's what you wear, it's whether it's who you're with, I'm getting rid of it. Why? Because of remembrance of who Christ is and what Christ is. Because there's a recompense if I take it lightly. And then the who of the examination is I'm not examining you. Brother Paul, I'm not going to examine you. I don't search you to find out what your heart's like. I don't search you. I don't go into your house. And I don't get on anybody here's computer to see what they're watching. Unless you ask me to be your accountability person, I am not. That's not my job. It's not the job of the church to examine you. It's the job of you to examine yourself. That's right. There's been examination. You say, but I, but I didn't see anything. Let me say, it's not the pastor's job. It's not the parent's job to examine you. It's your responsibility if you're old enough to make decisions. It's your responsibility. You say, but I can't, I, I can't see it. Why don't you ask God? Search me. Oh God, 
Try to know my heart. Try to know my thoughts. If you want your inward sins to be seen by God and God to reveal them to you so you can get rid of them. Many times, many, many times it's not the outward thing that's the problem. Let me just say that. A lot of times that bitterness. A lot of times that arrogance. A lot of times that pride. Those things that we covered up and we say they're not that bad. They're not that bad. Well, a person harbors some bitterness in their heart toward Christians because Christians did not accept him at that Christian school in Nashville. And now he's 20-something years old and walks into a Christian school and kills people that were not even there when he was a kid because he harbored bitterness. Do not tell me that that root of bitterness doesn't grow. Don't tell me it doesn't grow. It gets worse and worse and worse. And sooner or later, it explodes or blossoms into whatever is wickedness. Whether it be divorce, whether it be running your own way, you're bitter at your parents and you say, I'm going to get, and then you, next thing you know, you, you go your own way off into the world because you didn't like the way they had rules and regulations. And then you find yourself in a mess again. A bigger mess. That may have never happened to any of you. But I can say, I, I can tell you, I've seen it multiple times. Multiple times. Lord, search my heart. Try my reign in my heart. Make me to know my transgression and my sin is what Job said. <clears throat> that word unworthily. He deals with the, the, the or not whether you're worthy of partaking of yourselves. None of us are. All of us have sinned. But you have an attitude that says I'm not going to get right. It doesn't matter whether I am right. I am done. But if you come to that place of the examination, there's a place of expungement. Expungement. He says, when we're, he says, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Mm -hmm. When we go in and we confess our sins to God, confess our uh, sins to God, confess them and forsake them, then God says, you might be having some chastisement from this. There might be some consequences from this. But I will not pour out my judgment upon you for this. Thank God, Judah. Judah had a rotten uh, things he had done. He had uh, taken Tamar, his sons. He had promised her to, his young, her to his youngest son. But he did not give her to his youngest son. And then he went in under her. And uh, ended up, she got pregnant by him. And, when, and yet, you know what? He confessed it. He confessed about his guilt with uh, Joseph. He confessed these things. And he did not end up with the judgment. He ended up with the kingdom. It wasn't the kingdom of Reuben. The land was named after Judah. Why? Because Judah was a repentant one. Reuben was a cover-up one. He went into his father's concubine and he defiled his father's bed. It happened. One of his father's wives he went in unto him. Defiled. And he covered it up instead of confessing. And when the judgment seat of Jacob came about, in Genesis chapter 49, 50 in that area, it was brought to life. Not necessarily to everybody else, but at least to him. That was went into my bed as the fire. My cat. You do fire. God knows. God knows. But if we judge ourselves, we'll not be judged. He that covers his sin shall not prosper. 
but whoso confesses and forsaketh him shall have mercy. Proverbs 11 30 tells us. I ask you today. Where are you at? Are you covering up sin in your life? Are you living in sin and not don't care if God knows about it? Where are you at? 